Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to this big webinar. Thank you so much for taking time away from your busy schedules to join us for the next hour. My name is Mary Zampino, and I'm the Senior Director of Global Sourcing Intelligence here at SIG. I have the pleasure of facilitating today's Solution Deep Dive, the CPO's agenda for 2016, tackling procurement's key issues with Zykus and the Hackett Group. Before we proceed, I do have a couple of housekeeping and calendar items I'd like to review with you. SIG's Career Network. SIG's website offers a career network with postings for sourcing professionals and opportunities for internships. Here you will find job listings for all levels of employment. And just as a reminder, SIG is an excellent source for senior level opportunities and contacts. Please reach out to us so we can facilitate those conversations. Special member benefits. SIG has partnered with a number of our members to offer you special discounts on a variety of services and solutions. For example, you can receive discounts on market intelligence, assessment reports, and subscriptions. Check out these in detail by clicking on the Members menu from anywhere on our website. Social media. You can connect virtually to other BuySci companies and SIG members through our LinkedIn or Facebook pages or by participating in our peer-to-peer -peer program. There are so many rich discussions and fabulous connections here. Please join us in our online social community. Weekly webinars. Every week at 11 a.m. Eastern on Tuesdays and Thursdays, SIG hosts a free one-hour webinar. These discussions are an excellent way to discover innovative solutions and best practices for your sourcing and procurement challenges. A few of the upcoming webinars are listed on your screen now. And you can see a longer list of scheduled webinars on our website. Please note, each webinar has its own unique invitation information, so you must register for each individually. Town Hall Teleconferences. SIG offers monthly Town Hall Teleconferences. These are non-recorded, open mic discussions. Attendance is restricted to by-side organizations only. Presenters discuss innovative approaches and field questions from the attendees. These conversations are very organic, with SIG facilitating any follow-up networking and discussions. Past discussions have centered around governance, talent acquisition and management, leadership development, value add, and risk management. Our next town hall will be with Kelly Barner, the editor of Buyer's Meeting Point, who will present From the Trenches to the Treetops, Supply Market Intelligence in the Real World. Kelly will share her insights into the process for creating and documenting supply market intelligence. You will hear strategies for presenting supply market intelligence findings and recommendation to an executive audience. Remember, this is an open mic, non-recorded discussion with a successful program director, so here's your chance to get the right answers to your difficult questions. Registration is open on our website now. Just click on events and then teleconferences. Again, that is May 11th. SIG events. We welcome you to join us at one of our upcoming SIG events at a city near you. Symposiums listed on, listed on the left-hand side of your screen are a full day event with a keynote speaker, breakout sessions, roundtables, and plenty of opportunity for networking with your colleagues. Regionals, listed on the right-hand side of your screen, or a short one-day event with several topic presentations, benchmarking, roundtables, and networking. Our next event will be a regional meeting in downtown Chicago hosted by Healthcare Services Corporation and will feature several presentations, including sessions on cybersecurity and stakeholder management, as well as several structured networking roundtables. Agendas are posted on the website along with the opportunity to register. And if you are from a corporate user company, registration and attendance are free. SIG University. Our advisory board, brilliant thought leaders, and subject experts have built a phenomenal program for qualified sourcing and procurement professionals. SIG University is an online asynchronous curriculum offered to people of all levels in their sourcing careers who are seeking training opportunities. SIG University has received rave reviews from sourcing professionals who have completed the coursework. We are now accepting applications for our sourcing professional course on our June 7th, 27th start date and our governor's professional course which starts on May 2nd. Please visit siguniversity.org for more information. Student Talent Outreach Program. So our goal at SIG is to provide the best talent for your organization, and we partner with the highest rated supply chain and sourcing programs in the nation, such as Arizona State, Michigan State, NC State, and others. You'll see their students at our events participating in webinars like this, working to better understand your challenges and needs before they even arrive at your organization. Please reach out to us for more details or visit our website. 
So today's webinar is the CPO's agenda for 2016, tackling procurement's key issues with the Hackett Group and Psychis. On the call today, we have Chris Sochik, Principal and Global Procurement Advisory Practice Leader at the Hackett Group. Chris has over 17 years of experience in supply chain management, working directly with Fortune 500 and mid-sized firms around the globe and a variety of industries to improve all aspects of procurement, including process redesign, technology enablement, operation strategy planning, organizational change, and strategic sourcing. He is a regular contributor to business publications and is also a frequent presenter at industry events. Chris has been recognized by Supply, chain, supply and Demand Chain Executive Magazine as one of its pros to knows. His background includes engineering and operations roles with the both United Technologies and IBM. Also on the call today is Phil McDonald, who is the Director of Strategic Sourcing at Carl's Resner Hotel Group. Phil has 30 years of experience in expense, contract, and supplier management, resulting in over $50 million in cost savings over his career. In the past, he has served as president of TAG, the Angelus Group, which was a leading telecom expense management software company. Phil is also ITIL, which is Information Technology Infrastructure Library certified, and CCWP, which is Certified Contingent Workforce Professional. And finally, also on the call today is Richard Waugh, who's the Vice President of Corporate Development at Zykus. Richard started his career as a marketing and finance manager with GE. And over the years, Richard has evolved into a business leader and entrepreneur, where he helped launch the first online marketplace for sourcing and procurement, as well as co-founding one of the first software-as-a-service sourcing suite providers. With regards to supply management, Richard had leveraged his years of knowledge and experience and worked with the Aberdeen Group as an industry analyst. Now he is with Psychus, and we look forward to hearing from him today. Leads to, I'm sorry, we look forward to hearing him lead today's discussion about the CPO's agenda in 2016. And folks, these panelists have generously agreed to uh, accept questions throughout the session. So, in the bottom right hand of your screen, you should see a Q&A box. Simply type in your response, your questions there, and I will pose them to our panelists. So, without further ado, Richard, the floor is all yours. Thanks. Thanks so much, Mary. Pleasure to be with you today, and a uh, pleasure to be joined by such uh, such uh, august experts as uh, both Chris and Phil, who can really help us uh, get a, a framework for how to drive towards procurement excellence, how, how a procurement transformation involves people, process, and technology. Uh, for my part, I'll try to stick more to what I know, the technology piece. And just to provide a little bit of context, Zykus is in fact a technology provider in this space of an integrated suite of source-to-pay tools. So we really focus on that end-to-end -end sourcing and procurement process and how technology can provide the visibility to, to bring about a true process efficiencies, create visibility across that continuum of source to pay process and, and, and have true process integration as well. So with that said, we're really excited to uh, have uh, Chris Sawchuk, who's the, uh, has already introduced the, the, uh, the, the, the leader of uh, Hackett Group's procurement advisory practice, share with us some of the key findings uh, from Hackett Group's uh, key issue study for 2016. Chris? Yeah, thank you, Richard, and um, you know, welcome everyone. What I want to do today, and as Richard mentioned, you know, we have a study that we do, and it's it's an annual study that we do and have been doing for about ten years now, and we're actually launched the study at the tail end of every year. So the particular insights that I'm going to share with you today were actually, you know, the results of a study that we launched in the December timeframe of last year. And so what we're asking organizations around the, this, the, around the world, this is a very global study, not only, you know, providing insights into North America, but also, you know, ENEA, uh, Africa, you know, Southeast Asia, um, you know, South America, et cetera. So it's a very global study. Um, I've been asked in, at times to say, you know, Chris, I, I see this, I see the global insight. Is there a difference between what you might see in Europe say, versus North America? The answer is yes. Um, but the point I want to make today is, is that this is going to be the global, you know, accumulation of the insights that we see on a global basis and really 
providing some insights into the priorities that procurement executives have. And I'm going to share some of those insights this year and also some insights in terms of how things have changed over the last several years. So to begin, the study that we do is not just focused on procurement. Uh, there is a section that's all focused on procurement, but we also do an enterprise look as well. And I want to share one insight with you from an overall beyond procurement type of insight. And the insight is, as we asked organizations more broadly, you know, from an overall standpoint, what are the priorities that you have um, and, and, and in terms of major initiatives that you have planned, you know, over the next year uh, in 2016 and beyond for your organizations? And the, the comment here is that enterprise cost reduction is taking center stage on the enterprise agenda in 2016. Now, it's been several years since enterprise cost reduction has taken, you know, in this vernacular here, center stage uh, for organizations. The last several years, it was primarily focused on growth. And if you went back a number of years, and certainly back to the recession of 2008 when we had a significant downturn in the economy, and as we went into 2009, the focus on cost reduction and trying to at least maintain our margins in this very difficult environment was the primary focus of organizations. But as we further got away from that event uh, that occurred back then, what you started seeing is more of an, equally, an equal balancing between our focus on growth as well as our focus on our margins. And at to a point that we can only save ourselves success so long and that we have to focus on things that enable the innovation, the growth of our organizations over time to continue to further increase our margins as companies. That has taken center stage up until this year. Now, the question is, why is cost focusing, you know, you know taking, you know, more of a focus for organizations and a priority overall? Certainly we see that in some of the natural resources businesses. You've seen what ha happened with the oil and gas industry, as well as the mining industry over the last several years. Uh, certainly, you know, that has had an impact on some of these areas. But, you know, if we went out and we looked at this by industry, certainly we would see some differences and variances in terms of what organizations are focused on. But in a blended way, on an enterprise standpoint, across the globe, this is what we're seeing in that cost reduction is now becoming more of a focus for enterprises overall than what we have seen over the last couple of years. Now saying that, and as we go into looking at what's focused, what procurement organizations are focused on, this is a list, and just to explain to you what this list is, we go out, you know, as I mentioned, in the tail end of every year, as we look into the next year, with a listing of objectives that organizations can select from and determine, are these critical or major important areas of focus for you as you look into the next year? And in this case, looking into 2016. So organizations have the opportunity to select one, two, or more of these areas and, and identify them as either critical or major importance to them as we look into the next year. Reducing and avoiding purchase cost is number one in 2016. And I explained some of the things that were occurring on a more enterprise-wide basis, and certainly that it has applicability to us in procurement as well. If we go back, you know, two years ago, what we saw every year we ran this study for the last decade or longer, we saw that reducing and avoiding purchase costs was the number one area of focus. It actually, in some ways, I, I like to, you know, I used to joke around that, you know, we, we get the study results and it was the big yawn because we always saw very similar types of insights. What happened two years ago was we saw a shift. And two years ago, what we saw is the priority of our organization shifted from just reducing costs to increasing in the influence that we have as sourcing and procurement and supply management organizations across the enterprise of our organizations. And certainly by doing that, that's going to allow us to improve some of the cost delivery back to our organizations, but it's also going to allow us to do other types of things. So there's the ability to actually increase that influence. Most of us were being challenged 
at the time and, and still are in terms of how we were going to continue to, to deliver the you know additional and increasing value back to organizations and, and it was being challenged because we weren't able to continue to focus on the same areas we had been focused on and do that. We had to focus on new areas. And so we had to think about how do we increase our influence across the organization. Last year, the number one area was elevating the role of procurement to one of a trusted advisor to the organization itself. And what's interesting about this is that we only added it to the list of priorities. Remember, I, I mentioned that we have a list of priorities that we put out there that organizations can select from. And, and we only identified that last year or added it to the list last year as an opportunity or a, a, an area of potential selection for organizations to choose from as they went through this list. The result was is that last year that was the number one area. How do we continue to improve our ability, the relationships that we have with our stakeholders, the business, the functions, the external customers that we support, and to be one of those and be thought of as that trusted advisor back to the businesses that we support. As you further go down here, areas like improving agility of our organization, certainly with the volatile marketplace that we're in today, and some of the uncertainties that exist as we look forward, um, the ability for us, not only in procurement, but us as organizations to improve our agility, to be able to react in much more of a you know, quick way, in a responsive way, and actually build, develop more of a predictive capability within organizations becomes an imperative that we have to have as an organization. As you further go down this list, you'll see other areas. And sometimes I get asked about, as you go further to the bottom of this, things like supporting the sustainability goals of the organization. And if you remember and recall, one of the things I mentioned is that we see some significant differences depending on the region of the world. If we were to look at these results from different regions, one of the things that we'll see in the EMEA European region is that we'll see sustainability and the supporting of sustainability goals be higher on this list of priorities than potentially we see in other parts of the world. So one of the things that is interesting here is, is just trying to understand how things have changed year to year. It's one thing to look at a stacked ranking of priorities and look at the percentages of organizations that have rated those priorities as very important and critical to what they're actually focused on over the next year. But what we see here is on the left is a listing. This is the same listing in, in priority order that you saw previously. So it's everything from the top to the bottom without the percentages. What you look to the right is those things ordered in terms of percentage of organizations that rank these priorities as higher or significantly higher compared to last year, compared to what they ranked it in 2015 versus 2016. And what you see quite quickly is that things like reducing and avoiding purchase costs, the area of highest priority this year on the study, is really helps us understand that it really has not changed significantly from what we saw last year in terms of increasing its area of, you know, its degree of importance to us as organizations. In some ways, this is, you know, and, and, and most of you probably already know this, this is table stakes. What has increased is things like the innovation within our organizations, increasing our spend influence and elevating our role in the sourcing and procurement organization to one of a more of a trusted advisor to the organizations and improving our agility. These have increased significantly more uh, compared to where we were last year in terms of their importance uh, is, a, is, a, is a one of our priorities as an organization. The other thing that we did with this is also to give you another dimension to look at here is not just understanding the importance, but also asking organizations, if these are the things that are important to you, what do you believe your ability to address these items are? And so the area around reducing and avoiding purchase costs, we saw that that was the highest priority, you know, for us as organizations as we looked into 2016. 
on a global basis, understanding that that can vary based on industry, it can vary based on region as well. But in terms of our ability to address that, we feel very confident that we have the ability to address and to meet that priority as an organization. It is a priority and we feel fairly confident that we can meet that and address that priority as an organization. Where we feel less confident are the areas that are red on this particular slide. Areas such as elevating our role to that of a trusted advisor, increasing our spend influence across the organization, improving the agility and our reactive capability and, and our flexibility and our predictive capabilities, you know, in our organizations, and then also the whole area around tapping supplier innovation. There are capabilities that exist within our supply base, and certainly innovation is one of them. Our suppliers have capabilities, and are there ways for us to enable internal business processes with our access to the capabilities, the innovation, and other capabilities that exist within our suppliers and supply markets? The answer is yes, but we have to become very selective in terms of where I decide to focus on those particular efforts. Now what I want to do is share with you a couple of other insights. I shared with you the listing in terms of our priorities, and there were several things that we called out. One of those was around the trusted advisor. And one of the things I joke about, I have a lot of organizations that ask you know, me, you know, if we want to become a trusted advisor, can we get trained to do that? And I always struggle with the idea of training someone to be a trusted advisor. The interesting thing here is you think about truly being a trusted advisor. It's not us, not us as individuals that denote the fact that we are a trusted advisor. It's the businesses, it's the stakeholders, it's those customers, clients, whatever you want to call them, that decide on are we a trusted advisor to them. And, and so one of the things that we wanted to ask organizations, because a lot of companies, you know, struggle with, you know, want to do that, want to set it as an objective, but really what does it mean and how do we do that? And so one of the things that we did is we went out to these same organizations and asked them, you know, what does it mean to you as an organization to be that trusted advisor? And what you see on the top of the list, consistently delivering on the basics. For us to be trusted, you have to de develop some capability in a repetitive way that you're able to deliver on, you know, the basics. It could be supply assurance, it could be cost savings, et cetera, that you create some kind of repetitive relationship that is trusted, that they can count on us as an organization to deliver on what they expect, that that is foundational in terms of actually moving into this trusted advisor kind of relationship. The other thing that was called out here is the idea around, you know, ensuring that we not only acquire, but we retain high caliber staff. Staff that's, you know, is able to work with organizations, you know, have those relationship skills, develop and understand what they're facing and come up with solutions for them that may not be, you know, sort of traditional things that we do as a sourcing and procurement organization and at the same time, increasing our agility as an organization, being able to flex to the needs of our customers, of our stakeholders in the business as well. Now, what does you know, agility mean to, you know, uh, to procurement and what does it really mean to increase our agility? The first thing we have to understand um, when we think about agility, one of those key priorities that we identified in our list of areas that we're gonna focus on in 2016 is that there are things happening on the outside world. Uh, and what that does is it forces us to change internally based on those types of things that are actually occurring. And some of the things I highlight here is hyper competition. We're in an environment today that we see companies emerging, you know, you know very quickly to become major global players uh, we also see companies that are very large and been around for a long time being disrupted, disintermediated. You know, one of the examples people use quite often is Uber. Um, and, and what they did, you know, a company out of the Silicon Valley, you know, came in with technology to disrupt a long-standing industry, um, you know, from a taxi standpoint and disrupted it with technology. 
and they focused on two things to actually make that happen. Not only was it disruptive innovation in terms of how they came out, but they also focused on the customer being king and focused, focused succinctly on making that customer and that customer experience better than it was potentially in the kind of, you know, services you had in the, in the other type of industry, the taxi industry itself. And it was very disruptive. Um, certainly there are government forces out there that are trying to, you know, you know stagnate some of that, you know, you know the disruption, um, but it's moving forward. But the other things that we see here, things like insight imperatives, us needing more insights and in, in, in uh, knowledge and intelligence about what's going on out there, uh, the intensifying competition uh, in the marketplaces, the volatility that exists in the marketplace. We saw, and I mentioned, you know, some of the things that happened in the natural resources industry with, you know, with, with oil prices, et cetera, and dropping very quickly over a period of time and then rising, you know, a bit, you know, over the last, you know, several months. But these things are happening. And for us to deal with those things that are happening on the outside is that we have to do things on the inside. And, and three things that we can think about is, you know, one is becoming much more predictive. Uh, we use this proactive decision making. How can we forecast? How we can get more predictive in terms of what's going to happen? We might not know specifically, but can we do ways and do things that allow us to understand more predictively what we think is going to happen with a much higher rate of success than where we might be today? The also, as you think about the value chain and how do we digitize our value chain, how do we digitize the relationships, not only with our customers, with our suppliers internally to operate, you know, much more quickly and be able to respond much more quickly with much more visibility than we've had before. And then lastly, creating an environment that puts the customer centric to everything that we do. Not creating a push model, but creating a pull model and developing services based on what our customers really want. Now, to become agile, really three things have to be in alignment. One is, you know, the idea of being this information navigator, um, making information centric to everything that we do, and understanding that intelligence and information and, and knowledge but really becomes centric, and it really becomes centric to how we deliver what we do, uh, not only to augment what we do in sort of the traditional services that we offer today, but ultimately that intelligence becomes a service in and of itself that we offer not only to our categories and category managers, but to the business as well. That we have to become adaptive, much more flexible in the way that we, you know, are able to change, you know, to the environment around us. And then lastly, you know, much more agile in terms of the way that we execute and deliver our services into a much more customer-centric way than potentially we have done in the past. Now, part of agility, as we talked about the intelligence, is to, is, is to have that knowledge. And so one of the things we also asked about was when we look at his organizations, how mature are our market intelligence capabilities and programs that we have in place today? And what we found out was that we're not necessarily as mature as, you know, potentially we thought um, across the board, whereas, you know, roughly a third of the organizations out there haven't really implemented a capability around supply market intelligence today and that those that have, and, and you get to about roughly, you know, over 50% of the organizations, that if we are have a program that we're using in a very narrow way, specifically in the supplier identification and qualification stage of our sourcing processes. And if you look at, you know, having, you know, intelligence being fully infused into everything that we do in supply management, um, you're looking at a very small and a very rare set of organizations that have been able to use that to enable everything that they do as an organization. Influence. And I mentioned a couple, you know, two years ago, spend influence was one of those areas that we saw that organizations prioritize as an area of focus for their organizations. What this is actually showing is there's a part of our spend, people use the term tail spend, 
and it's sort of that, that, that piece of the spend that's, you know, roughly 20% uh, of our, or 10 to 20% of our overall spend, um, um, or it, uh, it's a small portion of our spend, but it represents a lot of suppliers. And so the question is, if we did focus on this, what is the potential benefit that we might receive as an organization? So we went out and asked individuals. Um, the average savings coming back, and sometimes we believe that organizations are a bit optimistic here, is over 7%, 7.1%. We believe at Hackett that the percentage is probably closer to 4 to 5%. But the idea here is that there's value to be delivered and, you know, created in terms of better managing this tailspin. The only difference is how we approach it is going to be different than how we focus on our strategic areas. And certainly as you look at the tail and you look in there, you know, more intently, uh, what you're going to find is that there's some spend in there that should be part of your strategic spend. You're going to find opportunities to, to better, you know, make what we do more efficient so we can spend less time doing it. And, and really the biggest opportunity here is not necessarily spending more time on the tail, but freeing up the time that we do spend a day because it's an inordinate amount based on, you know, the potential uh, amount of spend that's there and the value that can be created, and, and use that time to focus more on some of the strategic spend that we're focused on today. So in terms of capabilities, and this is where I'm going to wrap it up, in terms of not only do we understand the priorities and what priorities we are focused on as organizations, but what are the capabilities that we will be investing in in 2016 as we continue to develop our organizations, the people, et cetera. Up until this year, the number one area of capability development within our sourcing procurement organizations has been focused on strategic sourcing. This is the first year that the focus shifted to one of a broader look at category management, which actually encompasses strategic sourcing. And what we have seen over the last several years is procurement organizations really getting out of the, the four walls of managing the processes within procurement and focusing on processes that allow us to engage more effectively with our suppliers outside our company, as well as internally with our stakeholders through category management. And certainly when we're looking at our suppliers, building capabilities around supplier relationship management. And I think the results here certainly reflect that kind of focus within organizations, as you see in the top four, category management, supplier relationship management, but also talent management. Talent's always an interesting area. And, you know, we've always seen that talent tends to be a, a large focus of organizations as we move further away from a traumatic time or economic situation, like what we saw back in 2009 and 2008, you know, with the downturn. You know, it wasn't until several years after that that talent, you know, rose to the top of capability building, not only in procurement, but in other areas across the G&A functions and across our enterprises. And as we move farther from that, what we saw is talent go down. What we've seen in procurement is that there's a continuous focus on developing the talent. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that as we look at where our priorities are shifting, as we look at where we need to build new capabilities, the focus on talent continues to remain a significant focus for procurement organizations. And then lastly, you know, similar to what we looked at from a priority standpoint, you know, not only do we understand where they are important, but at the same time, where do we feel that we have the ability to address these type of capabilities. And similar to the cost savings, strategic sourcing, we are, you know, it is a high priority for us, but at the same time, you know, it is something that we feel that we have a fairly confident ability in terms of addressing. Where we're less confident in building capabilities is in the areas of category management, supplier relationship management, talent, and then also in the area around some of the enabling software. Not necessarily some of the software that enables some of the processes like strategic sourcing, but in some of the other types of software in terms of risk management, uh, supplier lifecycle management, supplier relationship management, et cetera. So Richard, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to you. 
Thank you, Chris. And, uh, you know, just to revisit real quickly, our, our webinar topic for today is the CPO's agenda for 2016, tackling procurement's key issues. And, Chris, you've done a great job of setting that agenda for us. And what's top of mind for CPOs and procurement leaders this year? And now I want to segue into the tackling part, tackling procurement's key issues, and really invite Phil McDonald into our discussion here. Again, Phil is the director of strategic sourcing for the Carlson Residor Hotel Group. And, um, you know, Carlson Residor is, is uh, one of the world's largest, most dynamic hotel companies, about 1,400 hotels in operation and under development on a global basis covering over 110 countries and territories. So certainly a lot of dynamic activity in your environment, Phil, um, a lot of complexity to deal with as well. And I thought we might start out our discussion, if you could just describe sort of where, where are you in your procurement transformation journey and what steps have you taken to get there? How are you measuring your progress as you go along and, and maybe give us a glimpse of what the vision is for the 2B future state. Thanks, Richard. That was a good question. So I guess that's sort of a pretty broad question, uh, kind of brings in several different areas. So from a procurement perspective, as Chris pointed out, we have moved to a category management type organization. So we are embedded with our business partners, understanding on a cyclical basis, how are their requirements stacking up today versus what were they previously? And then how effectively are the suppliers that we're using meeting those requirements or changing requirements? The other thing that we're able to do is also get continued visibility of what's going on within the competition within those categories. So it's incumbent upon everyone that's a category manager to really keep an eye on what's happening with the suppliers out there in the market for that specific category. So it takes a considerable amount of effort to, to stay familiar and be an expert in that area. For example, one of the areas of software as a service is quite broad, but as a category, every time that we approach a software as a service supplier, we're always looking at what are they able to bring in terms of service and performance, SLAs, pricing, and then how, how are they going to be performing from a, a longevity perspective for our organization. Um, finally, I think um, the other thing that we evolved toward in an organization is being more consultative in our area where I'm being reached out to on a regular basis. You know, when you talk about being a trusted advisor, I, I'm getting repeated inquiries from HR, from legal, from our businesses and IT to give uh, some consult uh, to consult with them regarding, you know, what should we be thinking about now as next steps to really uh, continue to improve in our area with our suppliers. And so I go back to my usual 10 questions of trying to understand what problems they're facing and what, what are they lacking in today's supply base to help them help lead them toward getting to where they need to go in the future. And then the other thing about uh, when you talk about unleashing and tapping supplier innovation, the other thing that I'm, I'm finding is really helpful is coopetition, which is an old term. It's been around for quite a while, but really looking at what suppliers can you bring in with your existing suppliers and by bringing them together, uh, the strength of an innovative supplier with an existing supplier can actually accelerate the innovation that you're bringing into your organization without having necessarily replace an incumbent. So those are just a few things. Great insights, Phil. And, uh, you know, I wanted to follow up on this notion of trusted advisor that, that Chris teed up. Uh, it's, it's clearly a top priority. Uh, for most procurement leaders and most procurement organizations, but maybe more difficult to define in some cases. You, you've alluded to, I think, some of the, the tactics or techniques that you've used to, uh, to really elevate your role to trusted advisor, whether it's being embedded with your business partners to the point that, you know, you mentioned HR, legal, IT, asking you in on, on a consultative basis. Um, 
I was wondering, though, what tools or, or other techniques have helped you increase procurement spend influence? For instance, to what extent can analytics help you achieve that, that trusted advisor status? Sure. Well, so there's two parts to that, Richard. One is tools and the other one is process. So tools are always helpful, but if you don't have a process to maintain your tools and, and to bring the information in that's necessary, then, you know, the tools are only so effective. But um, I would say processes, you know, continual gathering of information, spend uh, information from different areas. So then when I get a call from an executive and asking, hey, what can you tell us about uh, a particular company that we're doing business with or we'd like to do business with, I generally have a lot of that information at my fingertips from our spend analytics tools or just from, you know, continuing to understand what's going on within the market with the supplier, within the category. Um, I'm pulling in information to understand, you know, what kind of relationship we have with different suppliers and then evaluating, you know, whether or not we should bring them into uh, the fold. Uh, as a larger supplier, they might be a small player at this time. But, um, you know, we use uh, I analyze as one of the Zykus tools today to bring in the spend that we have from across our organization globally. And that, that was quite a monumental uh, effort to begin with, just getting everyone to free up the information, pull it, pull it in from desperate sources, and then be able to see, okay, how many suppliers do we have out there? How many are in the same category? And then how, how much are we spending with each category? And then and when you talk about managing the tail spend, we were able to see a lot of small suppliers that we were able to consolidate with some of our larger, better performing suppliers that improve the efficiency of our organization by getting rid of the less efficient suppliers or marginal suppliers. Oh, that's terrific, Phil. And, you know, another theme that, that Chris uh, teed up for us was, was the fact that cost reduction is still at the top of the priority list for most procurement organizations. So I note in your bio here you've tallied over 50 million in cost savings. So, you know, back back in the day, back in my day, there was the six million dollar man, but with inflation, you're the 50 million dollar man, and and an authority on cost reduction. And kind of wanted to get your sense then. How do you balance the the mandate to continue to deliver those cost savings? with also finding other sources of value creation uh, from your operations? Sure, so cost savings is not something that you just go after in 2008 and 2009. Cost savings is, is basically something that is something you're looking for all the time. And it's not just by running an RFP and then knocking, you know, knocking the price down with your incumbent. It's actually looking for those inflectional changes within, let's say, IT especially, uh, where you know a new technology is coming in that can significantly lower co costs and improve your operation. So you know it's not enough to just say, "Hey, make this investment to lower your costs." It's make this investment. So you know, advising our business people on how to make an investment that not only will reduce their costs but improve capability and performance is really what's key, and that's, that's what helps you be able to get the business to move forward with changing from one supplier to another. I think too often people look at procurement or sourcing as just beating up the suppliers for a lower price, but if you never change suppliers or don't have the appetite to change from one supplier to another, you develop a reputation in the marketplace of, well, they're, you're, they're just being up the incumbent to try to get a lower price. And at some point, you get to a, a zero-sum game where you, you just can't make any changes in terms of what you're paying for things. So continuing to look for the competition out in the marketplace that will transform your organization to new technology and new ways of doing business it's more efficient, makes your investment ROI much higher. So, I mean, it's, the cost savings comes in, but ultimately we have to show a return on investment 
to our stakeholders, and that does result in cost savings on a repeatable basis. Oh, thanks, Phil. And so you mentioned return on investment to the stakeholders, and and uh, I wanted to follow up on that a little bit more to talk about metrics in general, and kind of get some insights to what kind of dashboard metrics do you track, and assuming there may be some differences uh, in, in terms of the audience or the constituency, what, what metrics do you track and report to the C-suite, and maybe what, which ones do you use to monitor performance within your procurement operation? Sure, so we have several. One is the sourcing value contribution, so that is strictly how much did we influence the reduction of costs for the next 12 month period. And the, the, but the other KPIs are important is, for example, you know, when I got introduced, you know, I, I'm a certified contingent workforce professional. We're able, we were able to drive improved KPIs from our staffing perspective where when I took over, we were converting people from posting to placement was 30 to 40 days. Now we're consistently under 10 days. So we have a strong result in that area just by, and that, that took uh, supplier management, process management, and then also bringing in the right types of suppliers that could really, they were deep and long in uh, the, the types of talent that we needed to bring in from a temporary basis. So it's, it's a holistic approach to your suppliers um, to really be able to be able to bring in all these changes that we're talking about. And it sounds like a holistic approach in, in sort of measuring the organization's contribution, things like the sourcing value contribution across the organization sounds very, very innovative in that space. And, and on the topic, Phil, of innovation, let's talk about supplier innovation, uh, which Chris, Chris mentioned in his presentation as well. And if supplier innovation is sort of the upside opportunity and supplier relationship management, you know, how do we maybe contribute to, to top line revenue through through uh, procurement-led collaboration with suppliers and so on. Uh, with suppliers, there's, a, there's also the potential downside of supply risk. And I wanted to talk about that topic, supply risk management, to get your sense on how, how do you measure it, what steps have you taken to mitigate potential supply risk? Oh, that's a great question. So from, a, let's say, a software as a service provider, First of all, we, we do a network assessment to look at what kind of security the uh, supplier has to protect our assets and um, you know, whatever we're doing with them. Secondly, we also do a financial background check of our suppliers periodically, and we compare that to the competition in their, in their area to ensure that, um, you know, they're not becoming a financial risk. And we've seen that over time where one company you've been in business with quite a while now becomes financially unstable. And, and then you see other companies that they're competing with are showing extreme financial uh, strength. And so that's also an indicator that maybe we should be looking at this other supplier, not just for a risk of the other one going out of business, but there's a reason why they're financially strong. And, and that's another reason to look at them. And finally, um, when we're, we're doing a risk assessment, we, we um, put a list of maybe seven to 10 different items together to show, okay, what's, what's our risk of staying the course? What's our risk of changing? What's our risk of, of this technology versus going with the other technology? So we, we create a whole scoring matrix of, of items that where risk could exist and then we rate it based on the, the likelihood of something happening versus what would happen if that likelihood actually occurred. You know, so how catastrophic could that event be? So if it's a low risk but high probability of, of um, damaging the company, that affects your scoring. And so we put those types of matrices together with the business and then create that scoring matrix as part of our business case going back to the executive leadership. 
Very interesting. I think a lot of times the risk assessments or planning for the unknown, and, and sometimes there's maybe the unfounded belief that staying the course or do nothing doesn't represent any risk, but you're taking that into account in, in your assessment. That says if we do nothing, what are the risks to us as well as as, as making some uh, some different adjustments? So that's that's really compelling and interesting as well. So I want to get a sense for again back to your procurement transformation journey from a technology enablement standpoint. How far would you say you progressed, and what are your key initiatives for 2016 and going forward? Okay, so you know, we've made a real transformational journey from a sourcing tool perspective. We started out, I was always a best of breed type guy where uh, I wanted the best sourcing tool or the best spend analysis tool or the best contract management tool. But over time, what what I saw as a change in the industry was that more and more companies were coming out with suites of products. And when you look at what what it's like to go with a suite of products uh, versus a um, individual tool, you start seeing, well, gee, there's some synergies of having one module connected to another all within uh, a database. Also, all your data is in one place, so you don't have a risk of losing data as you move from one supplier to another. So. So that's why we've moved to the Zyka suite of tools where we have spend uh, availability, contract management, um, sourcing, and now what we're doing is we're also leveraging supplier management tool so we can create KPIs and, and do scoring of our suppliers to keep an eye on with the business uh, how their suppliers are doing. And then the, the biggest uh, changed for our organization now is we're rolling out to our hotels globally is an e-procurement tool through Zykus. And that, that particular tool uh, we've been working to launch now for, it's been 11 months, but there's been a lot of work that's involved in terms of we had to build catalogs, we had to punch out to our different suppliers. We're going to start a pilot in June now with five, five sites, and then we're planning on going to 20 sites roll out per month. Um, worldwide, so we're really, this is really going to start accelerating second half of this year. And what, but basically we're, we're offering to our hotels and all these different sites is an ability to purchase from our contracted preferred suppliers through one portal interface, single sign-on, so that, now uh, yes, they may cherry pick, you know, if they see, a, well, they might perceive a better value with a local supplier. They might choose not to use one of our suppliers, but we, we expect to see a considerable increase in spend with our incumbent suppliers that we think bring great value to our sites. And so what, how we'll measure that is actually we, we measured prior to the rollout what percentage of, of uh, these sites we're actually spending with our existing suppliers. And, and so we got the ones, the top third are really spending a lot with our incumbents. Uh, middle third are sort of halfway there, and then the bottom third are really not spending very much at all. And we want to lift that bottom up, at least to the middle, and the middle up to the top. And we'll be able to measure that as we go forward, but I think the impact will be the sites will be able to not only get a better price, but they're going to be able to leverage the, the service that these suppliers were brought on to provide to our, our hotels. So we're really seeing that as transformative. And, um, you know, it's being launched in Brussels. Uh, I think they're, they're launching in May, and we're launching in June. So, big deal. Exciting times. Yeah, great progress to date and, and more to come, it sounds like, Phil. And really appreciate uh, your taking the time to, to, to share your insights and the dialogue with me. And, Mary, I'm sure um, we don't have a lot of time left, but I'm sure uh, folks in our audience may have some questions they'd like to ask of Phil or Chris as well uh, based on, uh, you know, things that have come up through our discussion today. You know, my favorite question is always about change management <laughs> and what, what best practices uh, people have for encountering um, those really difficult issues. You know, we have these fantastic insights in front of us. We might even have an A, B, and C plan to incorporate them, but then we start implementing them and we face, 
you know, some some challenges and, and just always appreciate the, the top three best practices for, for change management and handling naysayers from any kind of, um, any of the three panelists uh, and especially those who, who are practitioners <laughs> or have been practitioners. Yes, and, and Phil, I think you're dealing with uh, sufficient complexity in your environment where you've got, you know, not only owned and operated hotels, but also franchise operations. So you're you're dealing with sort of a a, a mixed group of user users that you need to get adopting new technology, and, and change management is certainly an issue that you've faced. Sure. So you know. Uh, the first thing was two years ago, two and a half years ago, doing some market research within our own organization to find out what were the pain points of the, that the hotels were going through to make purchases, and, and you know, problems were many. You know, certain suppliers, they fax information orders to, some they call, leave voicemail messages, other ones, um, you know, they, they have to go out to a portal for one, and you know, every, every and then maybe email a purchase order for another one. So it was very complicated for the hotels to make purchases. So that's what led us to wanting to bring on an e-procurement tool uh, to our hotels to meet the needs to reduce the complexity of the purchasing that they're doing. So when it comes to naysayers, the naysayers, we, we have already know what the objections are and we have the counterpoint to the, all those objections by doing our research up front and also talking to our operations people to see what they're hearing. So we, we come in pretty pretty well loaded for bear with answers to the naysayers. That's an excellent plan, excellent plan. This question might be a little bit too broad, but I'm gonna um, go ahead and give it to you anyway. It says, from a professional services consulting perspective, what procurement trends do you see? And again, if that's too broad, we can follow up offline. Well, I, I would say, you know, we're moving away from from buying IT hardware and moving into software as a service is huge. But that brings its own problems going forward. <laughs> is how, how do you manage all your software as a service suppliers? And that's a whole other topic. But I, I think that's a big area. The other other thing, other trends that we're seeing is that. Companies are starting to shed a lot of their expertise, so we're, we're bringing in um, staffing experts. Uh, well, staffing through staffing, we're bringing in temporary CEOs or CPOs or whoever you might need, or consultants in IT space or security to augment the areas that where companies are shedding, uh, you know, the, the, their normal staff. So, procuring procuring uh, human capital is is changing quite a bit as well. Excellent point. Well, are there any other further comments or questions from the panelists? Or shall we give some time back to our to our attendees on their calendar? All right, excellent. No, I didn't have any additional, yeah, no, no additional comments. Excellent, gentlemen. That was a, a wonderful hour. I learned a lot. I really appreciate it. On your screen now, folks, you should see a pop-up, which will allow you to download today's presentation in PDF. In addition, we will have a recording of this session up on the SIG website so those with usernames and passwords can access and share this with um, their uh, colleagues for the next three or four years. Um, you can contact us if you need a username or password. And I just want to thank our panelists and remind folks that our next weekly webinar is going to be this Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern, which Coupa will present procurement and sourcing usability for all. Attendees of the webinar will learn how to negotiate more efficiently, gain greater visibility into spend, achieve full adoption and compliance, save time and money impacting the bottom line. Registration is open on our website now. I hope to see many of you there again this Thursday. And thank you once again, gentlemen. We really appreciate you taking the time to bring the spot leadership to, our, to us and to our members and to those on the call. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.